Section 21 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Devorah Allen. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 21. What is the American Language? By Ring W. Lardner. This is my first and last chance to review a book, and I wish I could give it a good pasting. There's even less fun in writing eulogies than in reading them, while infinite enjoyment can be found in hopping on a literary cripple, knocking it for a corpse, and strewing the grave with an elegant shower bouquet of raspberries. Anticipation of that was what persuaded me to take this job. But they crossed me. The book ain't a cripple. And not having met Mr. Weaver, I can't even paste him personally. He may belong to the Lord's Day Alliance, or wear two-piece woolen underclothes, or tell unclean stories in unclean Pullman washrooms, but I don't know, and I'm afraid not. So I'll have to make the best of a rotten assignment. The faintest praise with which I condemn the book is to say that it's a damn good blank, of mostly blank, verse, readable and buyable because the poems have story interest and are written in the language we, this means you, speak. Pure American, nearly. The few impurities are a life-saver for the critic. We can't hope to land the old K.O. on the writer's jaw, but we can fret him a little with a few pokes to the ear. For the most part, this organ has served Mr. Weaver well, but I think that on occasion it consciously or unconsciously plays him false. It has told him, for example, that we say everything and anything. We don't. We say something and nothing, but we say anything and everything. There appears to be something about the Y near the middle of both these words that impels us to acknowledge the G on the end of them. Mr. Weaver's ear has also give, or gave, not gin, him a bum hunch on thing itself. It has told him to make it thin. But it's a real effort to drop the G off this little word, and as a rule our language is not looking for trouble. His ear has gone wrong on the American for fellow, kind of, and sort of. Only on the stage or in comic strips do we use feller, kinder, and sorter. Kinda and sorta are what us common fellas say. And how about the lines, Now that I'm sure he never won't come back, and You don't know how to dream and never won't. Never will and won't never are American. Never won't ain't. Other lines I challenge are, I crope up on him, and You should have hearn the row there was. I don't say crope and hearn are impossible. I do say crep and herd are a great deal more common. The line... Look what I done for you and him and me, is good American, but better American, I believe, would be, look what I done for him and you and I. This, however, brings up a subject to which one ought to be able to devote a whole volume, but one ain't going to. One is only going to state that mysterious rules govern the cases of personal pronouns in our language, and one hasn't had time to solve the mysteries even since Prohibition. We say, he come up to me in the club, but we also say, he come up to Charlie and I in the club, or even... He come up to I and Charlie in the club. Charlie's presence in the club seems, for some reason or another, to alter my case. The other night I was reading a play script by one of this country's foremost dramatists, and recurring in it was the stage direction, a look passes between he and so-and-so. But this playwright wouldn't think of saying or writing, she passed he a look. My theory on this particular point is that when the common American citizen, whom we will call Joe, was in his last year in school, the sixth grade, the teacher asked him how many boys there were in his family. He replied, Just Frank and me. Just Frank and I, corrected the teacher. And the correction got Joe all balled up. But you don't want my theories, and I can't find any more fault with Mr. Weaver's ear. Nor any with his book, except to say that no book can be really in American that denies admission to the favorite American adjective, lousy. Doubtless delicacy, not defective hearing, kept this out, but it's unquestionably our busiest adjective today. It describes so adequately such a great variety of things. Including this review. End of section 21. Section 22 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Recording by Eleanor Riley, Kalamazoo, Michigan. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 22, Woman Sees Steel, by Mary Austin. Many people have been looking forward to this book of Mary Heaton Vorses for more reasons than a desire for information on the steel situation. It is the first book of importance dealing with the subjects women will have to face in their new capacity of citizenship, with a voice in its final determination. In what spirit and manner will women communicate with one another on these things? Ms. Vorse is one of the investigators employed by the interchurch movement to report on the steel situation, one of the most acute industrial problems in the United States. Her experience and dependability in making such researches are sufficiently attested, and her opportunities to learn were exceptional. Everyone is familiar through the daily news with the issue of that investigation and the part it played in the Czech and presumably permanent overthrow of the interchurch world movement. Naturally, the question arises, what is there in the way a woman saw the situation that throws any light on the interrelations of the church and the economic and industrial world of men? From the first page of Men and Steel, which is agreeably published in a style that brings its price within all reach, one discovers a characteristic feminine directness in the approach. Mrs. Vorse went to see Steel, and that is what she saw, the whole gigantic process accepted as a fact, the way women accept things. Steel! After a little, the confused, overpowering impression resolved into elements. Smoke, fire, slack, steel towns, houses of steel workers, and finally men. Always she sees the men in little, dwarfed by the thing they serve. Always she seems them humanly. Nowhere is there any attempt to corner our sympathy for the steel workers as such, no abuse of steel owners, no discoverable bias, nothing in fact but the steady delicate stroke on stroke of a woman's seeing. She sees the sordid tenements of the river bottoms at Braddock, two-story brick houses, the courts bricked and littered with piles of cans, piles of rubbish, bins of garbage, hillocks of refuse, pale children padded in the squashy filth and made playthings of ancient rubbish. A little later, she says, what condemns them to live there is their children. The more children, the less chance of escape. Of two men she met, Milko and Pasterik, Pasterik has escaped to live in a house of his own with an outlook. Milko explains, four of his children die by diphtheria. My children, they all live. So for Milko, there is no escape. On such observed and unremarked upon incidents, Miss Vorse rests her case. It is the bright singularity of Miss Vorse's method that she nowhere attempts to do the reader's thinking for him. Neither does she make any attempt to overweight the situation in favor of the workers by playing on the reader's emotions. Here, her magnanimity toward her audience is supreme for Miss Vorse is a literary artist, ranking high in our native galaxy. Readers of her fiction know what she can do in the way of plucking at the strings of pity and rage and gaiety, but the style of men and steel is almost stark. The sentences are short, the descriptive matter reduced to a minimum, the writer's own reactions have about that relation to the narrative that the polished surface of a mirror has to the reflection in it. You may remark in passing that it is a fine mirror, but it is the reflection, after all, that claims you. There is no blurring of the lines. If she shows you the workers suffering unjustifiably under the situation, she shows them in the same stroke as rather ignorant and helpless. If she shows the owners, the burgess and the paid constabulary as prejudiced and brutal, she also shows them as rusting under our general human limitation. She shows them, and this is where the book bites at last, as us. That, I think, is Mrs. Vorse's final judgment on the steel situation. Both the steel strike and the manner in which it was finally worn down and stamped out, the reason why it was never intelligently adjudicated, why the germs of another greater and still more wasteful strike were simply swept into dark corners there to fester and breed, 
are to be found in the lack on the part of the American public of any wholesome and rectifying attitude toward it. We are either not so intelligent a public as we have liked to think ourselves, or we are more selfish and intellectually indolent. There can never be any good, sensible settlement of the steelworkers' troubles, because up to date there is a total lack of good, sensible suggestions. As a last touch, Mrs. Vorse effectively disposes of our lazy and self-exculpating way of dismissing the subject, saying, Well, if they don't like it here, why don't they go back where they came from? By showing that thousands of them ardently long to go back out of this unimagined confusion and disappointment of American industrialism, but that the conditions of the steel industry do not permit them to save the price of passage. I can offer no better evidence of the quality of Mrs. Vorse's book than the effect it has so unmistakably produced on the reviewer. Perhaps an important item of that effect is the manner in which the book has been put together. For the first time, we have a serious and dependable book on industrialism, which is not cast in the pattern laid down in the 18th century. There is in Men and Steel not a trace of the influence of the cloister or the university which has so far determined the general mode of presentation of serious subjects. The long argumentative chapter, the solid gray page, the academic insistence on a sequence of presentation which has nothing to do with the way in which facts are gleaned from life and experience, all these are banished from Mrs. Vorse's book. It proceeds by paragraphs, each with its own caption, suitably isolated from other paragraphs to which it has no relation except that they are parts of a whole. When there is no more to be said on a subject, the paragraph stops, even at the unheard-of expense of leaving the rest of the page blank. Perhaps the best way to characterize the book is to say that it is entirely feminine, recognizing that femininity in intellectual procedures is nothing to be afraid of, may even have an important service to perform in releasing us from the pod snappery of the intellect. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Bookman, March 1921 by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by betty b the bookman march 1921 by various section 23 repentance by daniel henderson come mad march do you repent temper so incontinent vented on each darling bud that dared to lift through mist and mud to see you wavering in the hold of spring's warm arms and winter's cold yea wild month it must be so for see the last fierce swirl of snow that was the symbol of your wrath has melted by the garden path and bathed the jonquils shivering spears in a very flood of tears end of section twenty three Section 24 of The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Bookman, March 1921, by Various. Section 24, Foreign Notes and Comment, by Alan Wilson Porterfield it has been reported that maxim gorky had broken with the soviet government of russia and was on his way to capri where he intended to live according however to the latest message from moscow dated december twentieth gorky has not quarrelled with the soviets any more than they have quarrelled with themselves has not left russia and has no thought of doing so the new rotterdamish courant an altogether respectable dutch daily is running james oliver kerwood's the valley of silent men serially as a feuilleton it is entitled in dutch het still dal a question arises what idea is europe forming of us from the american novels that are now being used in this way novels written by such writers as upton sinclair nathan coosey and james oliver kerwood 
the cultural union of the chamber of deputies of czechoslovakia has advised the nobel institute of stockholm that it will be making a serious mistake if it does not confer the nobel prize for literature nineteen twenty one on the czechish poet atakar brezina or the czechish novelist alois jirasek by way of intimating who is who in letters in the youthful republic of czechoslovakia the suggestion is of value since the days however of very long ago the swedes have been noted for their ability to listen to advice without taking it gildendal the largest publishing house in the north and one of the largest in europe opened for business in december seventeen seventy apropos of their one hundred and fiftieth anniversary they have issued a bulletin showing what authors hold the record in the north of the four best-known norwegian writers they have published in round numbers three million copies of bjornsson's books two million two hundred fifty thousand of ibsen's two million one hundred twenty five thousand of lies and one million two hundred fifty thousand of jellens of danish writers holger drachman heads the list with six hundred eighty five thousand george brandis comes second with five hundred forty one thousand heinrich pontopidon third with three hundred thirteen thousand johannes v jensen fourth with one hundred sixty six thousand and jens peter jacobsen fifth with one hundred fifty six thousand among other writers whose works they have published in numbers exceeding one hundred thousand are the danes hermann bang sven fleuron and gustav weed the norwegians johann boher and peter edge selma lagerlof among the swedes and gunnar gunnarsson of the icelanders when we recall that the combined population of norway and denmark is a scant five million and that the dano norwegian in which bjornsson wrote can be understood only in norway and denmark the sale of three million copies of his books is highly creditable to scandinavian intelligence the first copies of Newt Homsen's latest novel, Konern ved von Posten, The Women at the Well, have arrived in this country. Consisting of 559 pages, it is as big in thought, character drawing, and general contents as in physical size. The women gather day after day around the town, pump and editorialize on the happenings of this quite remarkable world in their quite remarkable way on page five hundred fifty two newt homsen says some impatient souls would like to take hold of the running of the universe and reform it all around they plan a world entirely different from the present one draw up all manner of programs and prepare to eliminate folly root and branch they do not do it out of a spirit of arrogance nor do they crow to heaven they are rather quite courteous and proceed on their way with prayer they whisper affectionately to the pages of the song-book before them but somehow or other the music that is really played is not that of any one man this is neither a diatribe against orthodoxy nor an espousal of fatalism but plain common sense when the new fray press of vienna invited hugo von hoffmannsthal to write the article on the one hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the birth of beethoven it conformed to the happiest traditions of continental journalism if the author of electra oedipus the death of titian and venice delivered could not appreciate beethoven in retrospect and transmit his message to the present no human immortal could in a brief pamphlet on the poet and the present written in nineteen hundred seven hoffmannsthal born in eighteen seventy four said the poet spends his days seeking out the harmonies in his soul and trying to coordinate the world within him he synthesizes the contents of his age of beethoven he wrote on december sixteenth nineteen twenty he entered the world of mozart and haydn somewhat as adam entered between the streams of paradise he was the first homo he spoke not the desecrated words of language but the living word and the living deed and they became one what he spoke is not popular and was never meant to be he had what the people as a whole know not and what many individuals impiously claim spiritual passion this he made the seat of music 
strong as a giant he was as naive as a child he knew and felt all emotions except doubt surely wounded in that one of his senses through which he became heir to the supersensuous he resembled moses who had to talk with god for his people and yet was a stammerer writing under the caption of william archer creator of the league of nations leon kellner professor of english at the university of cernowitz says who first conceived of the league of nations i do not know that it was not woodrow wilson is certain i dare say some academy will some day offer a prize for the answer to this question but i am happy to state that i can inform the world who was the last man to draw up the idea so that it needed only to be adapted to the situation that grew out of the world war in nineteen twelve methuen published a slender book of one hundred twenty six pages at london called the great analysis gilbert murray wrote the preface the text was published anonymously its author was william archer the most cosmopolitan journalist in the english language the publicist and critic who after a generation of effort has given the english stage a new tradition and paved the way for shaw galsworthy maysfield and others of the dozens and dozens of books written on the league none gets at the root of the business so admirably or is so discriminating in its argument as william archer's the professor's imagination has served him over well mr archer's treatise though suggestive at every point hardly does more than show that what the world needs is a conclave of representative investigators and thinkers brought together not by election but by selection from all quarters of the globe it would then be the business of this white nigamot to take an invoice of the world's good will and ill will analyze the situation and by synthesis offer a way out the germ of the league is undeniably in the treatise but it is there more or less as the rock of the cathedral is in the hills the millennium will have arrived when a prize can be awarded in literature without raising an argument ernest perchon has been given the prix goncourt for his novel entitled nin and nobody unless it be perchon himself is satisfied the paris publishers who rejected the manuscript are piqued at themselves for displaying such poor judgment the provincial publisher at sevres is worried because he cannot fill the orders for nin the london athenaeum says we suspect that there has been an unconvincing compromise like that by which senator harding was chosen to be republican candidate for the presidency of america diplomatically speaking this is a reprehensible suspicion paris is disgruntled for with all her literary luminaries m perchon does not live there he does not even know the street as the city on the seine came affectionately to be called by permissionaires of the a e f the heirs of george sand are out of sorts because the work is said to reflect the atmosphere of her francois le champi which was not crowned the school-teachers of france are jealous because they cannot bolster up their pay envelopes with royalties after the fashion of their colleague the humble ernest perchon and finally the critics of france are routed for not having discovered this genius before nin incidentally is not his first work it tells the story of a farmer who having lost his wife engaged a preceptress for his children egoist that he was he married again but his second wife unable to bear up under the affection the children have for nin sees to it that she is discharged nin straightway drowns herself this garnished as it is with some church history would have given edmund de goncourt eight or ten hours of unaffected delight and there are dollars advertisement and dignity in it for the american publisher who will bring it out in english end of section twenty four section twenty five of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the bookman march nineteen twenty one 
by various section twenty five allegiance by hildegard flanner i have not forgotten yet skin that chokes like mignonette i who drank myself to death with the apples of your breath i who blasphemously went into your beauty's tenement i who eagerly confessed upon the altar of your breast i who falter in the snare of your canary-coloured hair sacredly could not forget skin that chokes like mignonette end of section twenty five section twenty six of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various section twenty six the gossip shop edgar lee masters has sailed for italy the gossip shop listened slyly to his plans as he sat over a cup of coffee masters and robert frost are the burliest poets both might be farmers both are mr masters is broad stocky and in spite of good shoulders gives you an impression of being largely head and glasses he talks crisply he is the business man except when he discusses the american character there he goes very deep perhaps it is while he is ploughing on his farm for he has bought a farm and escapes from his law practice that he turns up a skull or two and consults with the hollow bones to learn of the ways of the middle west past and present perhaps he will do a book on the catacombs after he has consulted the skeletons of rome at any rate he told us that he is writing a play blank verse for he doesn't believe in rhyme for the stage then he told us everything about american poetry we agreed with him but it wouldn't be fair to us to tell what he had to say you see he's out of the country but we're still here why can't they find something to write about but ham and eggs said mr masters of course he didn't mean all of them and the gossip echoed mildly why the gossip shop journeyed with walter pritchard eaton that sage of all the berkshires to the first night of the green goddess mr william archer's first attempt at synthetic criticism in which as someone has remarked mr archer has not wholly embraced either of his first loves turning coldly from ibsen on the one hand and casting but a flirtatious eye toward playmaking on the other in the theatre your gossip had the pleasure of meeting a number of old friends and of observing at pleasant distances many of those celebrities without whose kind aid first nights would have to be postponed abandoned abolished in the broad highway that skirts the last row of orchestra chairs we came full upon frank willstock who could have stepped into any belasco production and played the part of a perfectly accoutred secretary of the treasury after six p m we had converse with him upon the two interests of his life the maddening scarcity of first editions of surtees and the merits of the latest similes by the six best simile makers in america then there was haywood brune pleasantly nonchalant and without the least nervousness apparently over the chance of mr arliss forgetting his lines as we came up from the smoking-room passed us by the immortal gymnasts george jean nathan and alexander wolcott all unconscious of the tremors of times square and looking as though it were the one thousand and first night instead of the very first that fabulous person whose name we have seen in the public prints so often and so often wondered about charlie knickerbocker was pointed out to us much to our delight he was modishly garbed in a top hat and tuxedo except and that greatly piqued our curiosity that his dinner jacket was a sack coat or so at least it seemed from our distance there too we found robert welsh of the telegram and each accused the other of not recognizing him and were introduced to a delightful person named kelsey allen of a famous daily journal known as women's wear a gentleman so full of the sap of wit that our small corner became quite boisterous with laughter and was reproved for its hilarity 
in the crowd we chanced upon lawrence rising whose new novel has drawn such enthusiastic comment from booth tarkington and had the pleasure of bringing him vis-a-vis -vis with professor william lyon phelps who had known mr rising when he was writing his first short stories and plays in california several years ago and over there lorette taylor in a very lovely evening gown and here and there many another professor brander matthews dr ludwig lewison kenneth mcgowan frank pope of the commercial s j kaufman and g s kaufman the latter of the times staff messrs benchley metcalf and taus but the list would be too long suffice it a winthrop ames first night and a very gay and interested audience and behind it all strolling along the aforesaid highway during the entire play william archer very modest and alertly attentive and amused by the snatches of comment and conversation your gossip had five minutes pleasant chat with him recalling an earlier meeting and remarking upon the happy omen that attended his first play namely the coincidence of the three a's ames arliss and archer three aces indeed jesse lynch williams writes the following letter concerning those who write about countries where they have never been it is apropos of wallace irwin's latest novel i always used to assume when chuckling over wallace irwin's delicious letters of a japanese schoolboy that he had merely caught and caricatured certain superficial japanisms in order to be amusing the journalistic trick of a gifted humorist who had no special knowledge of the japanese character since visiting japan i have read seed of the sun and have come to the conclusion that wallace irwin knows more about the social customs physical characteristics religious practices family life business methods smiling manners and mental processes of the japanese than most of those americans who go out to japan mr irwin has never been there and then writes serious books on their return about the eastern problem seed of the sun by the way is a serious book even though it is a novel and an entertaining one it deals with the western problem the problem of the japanese in california one we all ought to understand i never understood before reading this book even what the problem really was exactly what the japanese in california were doing that california had a right to object to or how they did it i see the point now it is an important point a serious problem i know now why californians get so excited about it to take a theme of that kind and make a novel of it which is not only interesting but amusing is a tour de force zell is an impressive novel it will be reviewed later in the bookman we had heard that its author was a young detroit lawyer it was a surprise therefore when he appeared before the gossip as a most direct-spoken quiet young american and announced that he was spending the winter in new york had just finished a play and was finishing notes for a new novel his first novel was the groper aikman writes english that's interesting these days also he writes with power that's interesting too we were therefore curious to know how it all started apparently a copy of tono bungay chanced on in a detroit bookstore stirred the lawyer to fiction not so many years after his graduation from the university of michigan it was the usual hard row if there is a more demoniacally tantalizing discouraging job than getting started in the short story game mr aikman writes i am glad to have thus far evaded it the long expectant waits for mail the leering postman the grinning members of one's family i shall never forget this sample of fate i had sent a rather promising manuscript to the american magazine then as now always kindly and hospitable to the beginner i had had some encouragement from the editor and i had what i considered some justification for hoping this particular manuscript would land about a week later one of my family telephoned my office there was a letter for me at my house my trembling inquiry elicited the fact that the envelope bore the return address four eighty one fourth avenue new york i recognized this as the address of the kroll publishing company the publishers of the american magazine 
and the envelope i learned was not one of the customary long and bulky ones returning my burnt offerings at last glowing with the proud realization that i had finally battered my way into a first-class magazine i hurried home at once in the middle of the afternoon yes the envelope was there i opened it and discovered a printed announcement from the woman's home companion also a kroll publication of a prize competition in embroidery how it came to be sent to me a male citizen i have never puzzled out the first number of a new poetry magazine appears this month it is the measure edited by nine young poets among whom are louise townsend nickel david morton genevieve taggart george o'neill and maxwell anderson if we were assured that they would publish only their own poetry we could bet on its success however they announce a new poetry journal is obviously an attempt to start something to demolish non-trespassing signs and encourage younger poets it might be also as the measure is an attempt to escape from cults both radical and conservative and function with a minimum of prejudice good stuff the stuff that convinces and endures is what we are after not long ago harry hansen the erudite gentleman who conducts the book page of the chicago daily news addressed the medievalists at the chicago university club after he had read from carl sandberg j v a weaver and others the local literati broke into the usual violent discussions of new poetry haven't they progressed beyond this in chicago the list of poems chosen by the bookman from the december magazines as the most notable of the month is the great seducer by kale young rice century the need of being versed in country things by robert frost harper's matter by lewis untermeyer century against treason by john drinkwater nation december twenty ninth the boy dreams translation from rainer maria rilke by ludwig lewison nation december first dead man's wood by osbert sitwell poetry a grave song by amy lowell and assault by edna st vincent millay new republic december twenty ninth miss kate marie by elizabeth maddox roberts atlantic monthly sea change by maxwell anderson new republic december eighth in the final choice of the poems of the month the critic is at liberty to add such poems as he may choose from his personal observations of the magazine verse what a terrible woman the gossip and the author of main street had just blown into a downtown clubhouse from a whirlwind dash down fifth avenue if there is one person in the world who walks faster than your gossip it is sinclair lewis also he has red hair also he is tall and thin also he speaks rapidly and has a nervous way of using his hands to return to the woman mr lewis found her typical of main street she was nevertheless completely of new york city she was square tailored and of an ageless age she had a square jaw and determined lips she represented well don't quite dare say what she represented we don't have to meet her said mr lewis then we launched into a discussion of the new novel it's to be for the city what main street was for the small town it will not be new york nor chicago nor minneapolis nor san francisco just the gopher prairie of american cities will it have its carol kennicott we don't know but we guess that the lady planted in front of her club bulletin board will be found in its pages overheard in the cosmos club in washington mr hoover to frank simons what are you so hard at work upon mr simons i'm writing a book on the peace conference mr hoover but everyone else has done that mr simons i know but that's why this one of mine is necessary you see i shall call it from utopia to bedlam fred lockley from oregon writes the gossip shop a fascinating account of pioneer literary days in the far west of the state's first author abigail scott dunaway and of harvey scott recently i visited cottage grove he says and talked to opal whiteley's grandmother 
her sister her teacher her roommate at the state university and many former childhood friends and former associates this burns the gossip with curiosity we are hastening to secure the interview for the bookman sherwood anderson writes from palos park illinois that he is cleaning up a bunch of short stories and has a novel under way between times he says that he paints often i have half a notion he says to chuck writing and do nothing but splash around in gaudy colors apparently he splashes for jean markey writes us that the exhibition of paintings now hanging in the arts club can be interpreted by no one including mr anderson one of them looked like the interior of a rhinoceros's throat infected with tonsillitis another burton rasco claims is decidedly phallic but funny as they are sherwood has sold two of them at two hundred dollars apiece incidentally though not admittedly the result of the sale of these paintings he sails for paris in may one would have thought he'd have set out for the south seas after receiving such a fascinating blob of romance as the following letter sent us by anderson it's from jerry blum who is painting in the tropical isles and is dated somewhere in october from the district of hitia papiete unfortunately perhaps expurgations of the most delightful bits had to be made unfortunately too the gossip shop stenographer resigned after copying the unexpurgated version it's raining and when it rains here in hitia it does so with a vengeance on old corrugated iron roofs under which we happen to live just now ain't worth a damn all day long i keep moving the things to dry spots we were invited to dinner to the main citizen of hitia last night the john d of the place had forks and knives and plates and good grub we literally swam to his house a little river runs along the front of his house and a coconut tree flung across is the path not being acrobats we had trouble but we arrived he was very grave i smiled and asked him to pardon my not having any pants i just wear a loincloth these days that's one wonderful thing about being down here you can walk around almost nude and let your body have a great time well what do you think that s s island croesus put on his pants just to receive me 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 like a nut comes without mine well we forgave one another and everybody ate an awful lot it was not as good as other native parties i have been to where everybody eats with their fingers that's great and i want to tell you it's some trick eating miti a sauce-like soup with one's fingers and not throwing it all around in a disorderly manner like well brought up and really cultivated s s islanders do there is nothing more embarrassing than when eating this sauce and you realize that instead of it all landing easily or rather being sucked in deftly a little stream of it goes down between your breasts they won't hurry their whole scheme of life is on the other side of the sphere the idea and power of money even today means nothing to them and they don't understand it one day at a place in the country they charged what would be equivalent to a dollar fifty for three people a little while later for one person they charge the same thing when you ask how much is the bill they ask someone else that might be standing near how to charge you they say and that is what you pay at one place the meals and stay for the night was two dollars but a carriage ride in an old broken-down buggy with an old rope for the reins they ask one hundred fifty francs for in times of peace thirty dollars now ten dollars i thought i couldn't live here because to get around to paint i wanted a carriage so i wanted to see how much it would be by the month using it every day they figured up and said it would be sixty-five francs a month about four dollars that was my first lesson they have no sense of exactitude only relativity a mother doesn't know how old her kid of two years is she just don't know dates mean nothing to them nor time nor place says the san francisco bulletin three book lovers sat discussing the magazines what was the most notable piece of writing they had seen in a periodical during the past decade curiously enough all three mentioned sir thomas brown by raymond m weaver in the bookman for october nineteen eighteen then they took to reading the article aloud 
and at the turn of each paragraph there was the comment that's the real thing or words to that effect it should be printed in letters of gold said one enthusiast and again there was agreement who is raymond m weaver someone asked and there was none to answer your gossip proudly replies he is a young professor of english at columbia university his room in one of the dormitories is lined with books on poetry and japan the walls are covered with japanese prints and his own paintings and the chairs are usually occupied by students seeking advice on subjects widely separated from the literary he is working now on his introduction to the works of herman melville he is as violently opposed to the new poetry as he is enthusiastic about the captain's fascinating romances of the south seas in the midst of academic distractions he finds time to do an occasional criticism for the bookman the dressing rooms of the cohen theatre in new york are not large when arnold daly his enthusiastic dog your gossip and the letters of congratulation on the actor's performance in the tavern were included in the furnishings there was little place for literary discussion however as daly drew himself rapidly into leather stocking we talked of american drama such as it is and of the plans for daly's new plays it was only by accident that we heard later of his book the dominant male is an unusual performance for an actor it is not only reminiscences of authors and of others but there are plays and essays and caustic comments on life and art two new poetry anthologies will soon be upon us marguerite wilkinson is editing her new voices and a new edition will be published while mrs waldo richards who gives her poetry play and story readings again this year has just published another anthology called star points no one in the country probably has followed literary tendencies more closely than robert davis former editor of muncie's magazine now that he's turned literary agent he's keeping his nose even more keenly to the scent mark me said he to the gossip shop the other day you're going to see a new thing happening in fiction we're going to have a series of highly romantic novels filled with the trappings of luxury but told with the utmost frankness and which is more important they are going to be written by women some day across your desk will float the big novel of the age and it will be written by a woman and an educated woman probably of the highest social class in the next few years women in america are going to lead the men on such an intellectual chase that the male sex will be gasping for breath we'll have another sappho and what's more important with the increased independence of woman she's going to sit down to write the truth about herself frankly it's never really been done and believe me it will be interesting reading we wonder if mr davis has the great novel up his sleeve at any rate we'll keep our eyes open to the procession of book jackets dancing across the well-filled back of the gossip shop desk whenever i make enough money practicing law said william alexander percy to the gossip shop i come up to new york for music and the libraries mr percy is so completely of the south so disarming socially that it's really hard to remember that some people consider him the most accomplished of our american lyricists the gossip shop doesn't go quite so far as that though it admires in april once very greatly we caught mr percy on his way to a cesar franc concert and he told us fascinating tales of negro minstrelsy of the melodies no one has yet succeeded in translating to modern music of wild jamborees in the cotton fields it was like a quiet walk through a summer evening this talk with the gentle southern poet h d mrs richard aldington and w bryher the author of development are spending the winter in california they write enthusiastic letters of the california climate mrs aldington has been doing a series of greek impressions they reflect the warmth and color of the coast apparently america is almost a relief after foggy london miss bryher writes it is a wonderful experience to visit america for the first time i have been waiting for several years to cross it is such a relief to be out of europe and the incessant memories of the war 
there is much more interest in books and literature in this country and so much more chance for development that last is interesting i'm afraid we can't generalize from that opinion but wouldn't it be nice if we could the publication of robert lansing's book on the peace conference is one of the most important of spring announcements it recalls tales the gossip shop has heard of that statesman's propensities at paris for drawing it seems that no matter how serious the moment in the council room mr lansing had his pad before him and with a facile pencil sketched humorous portraits of the great men around him apparently it was his method of concentrating no detail of the discussion escaped him meanwhile we wonder if mr lansing has illustrated his own book probably not however for a real souvenir of the peace conference what could be better than one of r lansing's originals of lloyd george george douglas of the san francisco bulletin the only man in the country who writes a metropolitan daily's editorials with one hand and a whole book page with the other made a good editorial out of that azure whiff of christmas tobacco that kit morley fabricated it was a good editorial and a happy portent if other editors would let their editorial hand know what their literary hand is doing it would be good and they might get mentioned in bob holliday's next book about men and books and cities yes this is the same george douglas that holliday told all about in murray hill's travels calling him erudite polished subtle and lots of things like that they call him g d out in san francisco ray crabtree writes from cedar rapids iowa of a new idea in book reviewing it might be called a book a week in the pulpit seven thirty p m informal service of worship with lecture based on dr samuel mccord crothers three lords of destiny so ran the announcement of the sunday night service in st john's episcopal church cedar rapids iowa the writer attended the service and listened to a very interesting entertaining and helpful lecture incidentally he noticed that the rector dr a l murray had solved the problem of getting a sunday night congregation the rector announced that the following sunday night everyday americans by professor canby would be discussed cedar rapids has sunday movies and some of the churches have large young people's societies that meet just before the night service some of these churches have very fine choirs and offer attractive musical programs to the night congregation yet dr murray has gradually built up a sunday night constituency drawn from all classes of people the librarian of the public library told me that after the saturday papers announced the title of the book to be discussed at st john's a demand for the book is generally made one saturday night five persons asked for the book announced in conversation with dr murray i learned that he has been reviewing books for several years and has had some newspaper training but not until two years ago did he conceive the idea of book review lectures he has presented to his night congregations books on personality character success history theology philosophy psychology and current problems people he said like all kinds of books i think however the largest congregation i had was on the night i discussed chancellor day's my neighbor the working man c k scott whose realistic novel blind mice settles the character of mother-in-law forever made a confession to the gossip shop not long ago scott has traveled over the world and back again he is middle-aged slow-speaking middle western the drawling american this is his first novel but there have been long years of apprenticeship joseph hergesheimer we are told burned his first sheaf of manuscripts that's true at least we talked to a man who says that he was present when the pages were carefully placed on an open grate midst murmuring of incantations and promises of no carbon copies not so mr scott he couldn't afford it until he was satisfied with his product he published under a pseudonym since he refuses to divulge the tag for his crimes we're quite helpless who knows perhaps he too should have burned his bridges from boston a prominent and entertaining literary lady writes the shop 
i do not believe in literary sectionalism but i do believe in noting with sympathy the larger groups of literary workers outside new york who are characteristic of the place as well as of the time they live in we have among us some of the best poets as well as some of the best advertised ones we have some of the best novelists as well as best sellers we have the most widely distributed juveniles and also some of the librarians favorites we have one of the classic humoristic essayists and two prize playwrights new england is still on the map end of section twenty six end of the bookman march nineteen twenty one by various